First Timothy chapter number four. And in verses one through four, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. Now you'll remember last week, we began a series. I do not know how long it will go. I'm going to try my very best to get through everything that I have outlined today, but I cannot make that promise because I have found much and there is much to cover and I condensed it. It, it was a lot longer than this, but I wasn't about ready to pull the brother Lawrence on y'all and try and get the whole series done this morning. But bear with me if we don't get through it we'll, we'll just have to pick up there next week but I'm going to do my best to say what the Lord would have me to say this morning but last week we began our I, I don't know what you want to call it an expose I, the introduction to spiritual warfare but last week we dealt with the doctrine of devils and seducing spirits and last week we looked at what those doctrines were, the methods that Satan will use through demonic influence in society, and how it can indirectly cause the church to fall out of the will of God. And you'll remember last week the indictment that the Lord inspired the Apostle John to write to uh, the church in uh, Revelation chapter number 2 was that they had allowed partakers of those things which had been sacrificed to devils to false gods into the church and they fellowshiped with them and by proxy they defiled the entire church now vice versa in today's terms there aren't people that are going out and making sacrifices to you know false gods slaying goats but there are people that through their efforts and through demonic influence and spiritual warfare they are endeavoring to do something not for the Christ that we know in the Bible, although they may call him that. They do not endeavor to, you know, exhort the name Jesus Christ and said they try to bury it. And the things that they have taught, even though they may have originated in occult teachings, now people don't know that. And there are ideologies, there are methods, there are philosophies that society at large is bought into. And if we as children of God, partake not of what was sacrificed, but the leftovers, the fruits of those demonic activities, that hinders God's church. And I heard, I was listening to Brother Andy Wells, Brother Mike, preach a message, it was in a revival a few years ago, but he said that when the devil sees us, he doesn't see you and me. He sees us robed in Christ. He sees us as what we will be, knowing that he, don't, he may not know what it is. Because John said, I, don't, I mean, the Apostle Paul said, I don't know what we're going to be like, but I know we're going to be like him. And the devil knows that too. So when the devil can tempt us not only to sin, but be partakers of these things that he inspired, that he authored, that he has influenced throughout some 6,000 years that man has been on the earth, when we partake of the devil sees it as if Jesus Christ himself is doing it. He doesn't care about you and me. But by making us become partakers, he sees it as a victory over the Lord Jesus Christ. Just food for thought. That's got a lot of meat on it. But coming from Brother Andy, that, that's usually all them, them thoughts that he has, they do. And so today, in the second part of our teaching on spiritual warfare, we're going to look at how satanic influence manifests or in other words, what we see on this side of it. Because when man fell in the Garden of Eden to sin, our eyes were closed to spiritual things. We can no longer, as Adam could, look up into the third heaven and see angels ascending and descending. We cannot look up and see you know, all the angels that God may have stationed on the earth. 
Right? We, the Bible says that he's appointed a guardian angel over each one of us. So every child of God has a guardian angel, but we can't look up and see them. Okay? And, I mean, certainly those that were gifted with prophecy or, you know, foresight, that they did see those things, they can't see them anymore because when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. There are no more signs and wonders. There are no more prophecies or visions. But just like Adam, who couldn't see those things, we can't look around and see the devil or, as it is in your Bible, devils or spirits, what the world may call demons in modern pop culture. Not the devil, but the third of the angels that fell with him. Their influence cannot accomplish anything on its own. It has to be adopted. It has to be practiced by someone. There has to be someone that just as we become the children of God, there are children of the devil that have given themselves over to do the will of the devil. So we're going to look at how it manifests so that we, being wise as serpents but harmless as doves, can number those things and being knowledgeable of them, witness and testify to others, because we are supposed to be a, an epistle known and read of all men, that by our actions we rebuke the unrighteousness of what the devil would have for church members and lost folk alike to be partakers of. Now first, if you would, this week we're going to start off in Jeremiah chapter number 27. And I want you to see this passage. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture because I don't want you to take my word on it. If you're taking notes, get your pens ready. And if you can't keep up, see me afterwards, or if I'm talking too fast, you know, maybe get the tape or look at it on YouTube sometime tomorrow. Okay, but all of these scriptures are not my opinion. These are biblical accounts of how Satan does operate. But in Jeremiah chapter number 27, we see the entire scope, in a nutshell, of those that work for Satan, whether knowingly or unknowingly, whether they are just partakers of what's left over, like we've already talked about, or whether they're the ones making the sacrifices and furthering the cause of Satan. Now, Jeremiah chapter number 27, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, it says, Therefore hearken not ye to your prophets, nor your diviners, nor your dreamers, nor your enchanters, nor your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you, to remove you far from your land, and that I should drive you out, and ye should perish. Okay, now in these two verses, namely verse number 9, we see different classes or different groups of individuals that are not claiming or are not testifying or are not giving the word of God because God's the one who's speaking in these verses. God is saying, don't listen to them. They're telling you a lie. And he gives them titles. We see prophets, diviners, dreamers, enchanters, and sorcerers. Now, if we were to classify these things into modern terms, Okay, the first group, which could go by one of two names nowadays, would be magicians and necromancers. Magicians and necromancers. Well, what is so special about these individuals? Well, in verse number 9, this would include prophets, diviners, and dreamers. Prophets, diviners, and dreamers. They claim to have knowledge or truth given to them by some higher spiritual being. They are the possessors of secret knowledge. What does a prophet do? A prophet hears a word from somebody and then speaks it. What does a diviner do? They, using their secret knowledge, look for signs, they look for indicators, they use what they have been taught to divine what the spirits would have us to do and the knowledge for now or the future. Okay, and then... Dreamers, who are they? They are ones that may not hear a word to relay, but they see something and try to interpret the meaning of what they saw. And most of the time, it'll be what people say. Well, I had a dream. I had a vision in my dream. 
But there are also what are called spirit walks, where you get a spirit guide, and they take you and show you things. They teach you things. And these dreamers that had a quote-unquote out-of-body experience relay what it is that they saw to show you. Well, this spirit wanted me to see it, and so now I will tell you because the spirit must know better than we. Okay, now, prophets claim to have the words of quote-unquote gods, lowercase g. Throughout the entire Bible, there are false prophets that are named false prophets. But there, in the Old Testament especially, there were false prophets that claimed to have the words of their God. Whether it was Balaam, whether it was whichever God you, you know they chose to worship because each tribe had their own. Where did that all originate? Because somebody somewhere heard or in some cases may have seen something and they worshipped it as a god because it had something that they did not. It offered them something that they could not attain on their own. And through a little taste that got them hooked, they wanted to know more. Now, we're going to look at a few examples here in a minute. We said magicians. Now, we think magicians. We think David Copperfield. No. Okay. Magician in your Bible means someone that knows something hidden. Necromancer, if you break down the word from where it came from in Greek, it means to talk to the dead. Now we know biblically that can't be true. The dead, the moment that they take their last breath on earth, are in hell if they don't know God. Or if they do know God, they're in heaven. We, there is a great gulf between living and dead man. We cannot traverse that gulf. No man can traverse that gulf. So if they're not talking to the dead, well, that leaves one of two things. They're talking to God, this Holy Spirit, or they're talking to the devils that fell with Lucifer, and through that voice, rather than discerning the spirits, they're offered something that they desire, in this case, knowledge, and because they desire it so fervently, they take it hook, line, and sinker. Now, the second group are what are called sorcerers in the Bible, or may be referred to in modern pop culture or throughout history as witches. Okay, now these are not individuals that are looking for knowledge. These are individuals that desire power. They desire to do something to convince you as proof that I have something, I've been introduced to someone that you do not have, and by that show of power, they seek to lure others. But it may not just be power to convert, it may be power to condemn. They desire to put curses or afflictions on other people out of revenge, out of greed. But some people desire these powers so that they can further themselves. And we're going to look at one instance in particular in the book of Acts where these individuals tried to use the power that they have to make gain. Whether it's clothing, whether it's riches, whether it's gain in society, whatever it may be, it is very selfish that they want to further themselves by using the power that they got from this spirit. Now, both sorcerers and witches they manifest powers or they conduct rituals to get the spirit to show the power for them. They may not be able to do it, but they conduct a ritual. They say a prayer. Or like in 1 Kings chapter number 18, they hoop and holler and dance around and cut themselves, trying to move the spirit to do something for them. In 1 Kings chapter number 18, which we're going to refer to again later, it was send fire down from heaven. Okay, but both use their powers to claim knowledge of a true God and as proof. They try to eliminate faith. Here, see it. It's right here. But without faith, it's impossible to please them. But see, they, they have zero interest in this. 
they had interest in this, they wouldn't have been out there looking for knowledge or truth, as they would call it. Right? Now, this satanic influence in the Bible, okay, we need to look at what motivates these individuals. Why would someone, either knowingly or unknowingly, commune with the spirits of those that rejected God and were cast out of heaven? Now, we know that Satan, he's crafty, very enticing, and those that fell with him are students of his. Right? They have all the same tools. They have all the same insight that he may share with them or that they may know. I don't know. But I do know that Satan's not all-knowing. But when something happens, he knows about it. He may not know the future, but he's been around long enough in 6,000 years. If somebody were to ask him, well, this is occurring, what's going to happen? He might be able to make a good guess. That's why sometimes false prophets may get it right. When there's only two options, you got a 50-50 shot. Okay, but why would those individuals turn themselves over? Okay, well, in Genesis chapter number 3, verses 4 and 5, we read these last week, but I'm going to read them again. This is the foundation and the root of why anyone would search after something other than God, because of this promise. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So it's not for your harm. God has lied to you, or those people that go to church have lied to you. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Self-deification. You can attain the level of God. That's the promise that he gives. That you can be just like him. In this case, knowing the difference between good and evil. But nowadays, I can give you more, because he knows that there are no more signs and wonders. There are no more apostles walking around that can heal people. But there are those that take it from me. I don't want to go all the way down this rabbit hole, Brother Brian. My curiosity is not piqued by the things that I've read, but there are a lot of disturbing things. And they go further down the rabbit hole because they think, well, this isn't the culmination of what was promised to me. It'll be one more step, one more step, one more step. And then one step takes them past the point where God judges them of no value and turns them over to a reprobate mind. Keep in mind, 1 Timothy chapter number 4, we already read it, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They are convinced that that's what it takes for them to have spiritual arrival, I guess is the word, or enlightenment, as they might call it. That they will finally understand enough to know what it takes for them to be acceptable in the eyes of God that they will be able to do what it takes for them to be considered holy. That's what they're looking for. It's what Satan looked for. He wanted to usurp the throne of God as the minister of music in heaven. But these individuals, not just seeking self deification we've already talked about knowledge and power and material possessions. Well, what's that? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Amen. But if we look at these specific examples, knowledge of one of two things. The spiritual unknown, things that are above us. Things that we couldn't figure... Why do you think he left this? Because we couldn't figure it out on our own. Amen. But Satan will tell you that he can teach you. And there's something out there that I desire to know. And if I can figure it out, then I'll understand what it takes to be on an even plane with God. But then there's also the knowledge of spiritual enlightenment. It's one thing to say, well, there's a lot I don't understand, and I'd like to know about it. There were a bunch of people that had a bunch of different theories on why the planets were out in outer space, on why the stars were hung in the sky. And it wasn't astronomers, because that is the science and the study of how things move in space. It is because of astronomers that our calendar is so accurate today down to you know, the quarter of a day so that every four years we have to have an extra day in the calendar. That originated in the study of the movement of the planets and the stars in the sky. But what they're talking about is astrology. 
astrology is an example of a somebody that may be a diviner that they will look in the sky and depending on where the stars are that means that you know this deity or this being isn't happy with this or this is an omen in the sky that means good things are coming there are those that try to interpret things that have no meaning but the devil tells them that there's meaning there but then there's the spiritual enlightenment where he says those that are specifically searching for a way to God he misleads them and they buy into not just a false doctrine but the doctrine of a devil and in some instances even become possessed by devils but why? for knowledge man is ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth they will look and they will chase after anything if they think that it's something that nobody else has ever figured out before but Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun so what's next well oh in knowledge okay we can see an example of that in Acts chapter number 13 verses 6 through 12 there was a false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus and the apostle Paul called him a child of the devil well why was he a false prophet because he was preaching a doctrine that was different than the one that was given to the apostle Paul and the other apostles his doctrine condemned people to hell and when he tried to persuade the governor or persuade the ruler away from trusting in Christ the apostle Paul said because you know you're a child of the devil because you know better but you're still doing it anyway he was struck with blindness for a season the Bible says now why did that happen to show that the power of God is stronger than the power that bar Jesus had so that the ruler wouldn't trust in the weaker but would trust in the stronger but then there are those that seek for power we can see this in maybe it's physical power or physical feats okay Luke chapter number 8 verses 26 through 36 the bad man of Gadara why did he have to live out by the tombs because he was unsafe they chained him to the tombs and he broke the chains there are those that seek to be some marvel among mankind and it may not be physical power it may be charismatic power it may be influential power it may be somebody behind the scenes but they want to be the one pulling the strings but they desire power but then also in first Kings chapter number eight they may not desire power for themselves but they may desire power to be made manifest to justify them and we've already talked about it. they tried to pray down fire from heaven all day long then Elijah told them, all right, you guys have had enough time. Poured water on top of the altar. Then fire was sent down. Then after they slew all the false prophets and the prophets of the groves, then he went down and he prayed on a, you know, hillside, mountainside, whatever it was, looking out at the ocean until he looked up and saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. Why did all of that transpire? To show that God had power over the rain, over the fire, that God was the true God. Is that not what the people shouted? The Lord, he is the God. But what were the false prophets, those that were practitioners of the demonic, what did they seek? They sought for a manifestation of power. Okay, we're going somewhere. Bear with me. Then material possessions, we can look at Acts chapter number 16, verses 16 through 19. There was a woman that followed the apostle Paul and uh, Silas around, you know, antagonize them saying behold those that come from God and then the apostle Paul turned around rebuked the spirit and the spirit left her she was possessed but then she wasn't possessed anymore and verse number 19 says and when her masters saw that their means of gain they used her and the demonic spirit which they believed to be an undead spirit making her a necromancer they used that for gain people would come to her to have palms read they may not have done that but futures foretold or how to remedy a situation in their life maybe to craft a charm to bring them good luck and they used this woman's spiritual possession as means for their profit okay keep all three of these things in mind because we're going to come back to them here in a little bit but then thirdly I want you to notice how this has polluted society. 
and this is where we run into things that may take me very long to get through, but I shall do my best. Okay, we have already established through what we've read this week and last week that there were false gods. Let's take Egypt, for example. Israel's in captivity over in the book of Exodus. And while they are in captivity, God takes Moses off of the backside of a mountain. He says, I'm going to make you the deliverer, the one that goes before them. I'm going to deliver them out, but that's what they call Moses, the bringer of the law. But what did God first establish to do, not only to prove to Egypt, but also to the Israelites who had been in captivity a long time, that he was better than the gods of Egypt? Well, what's one of the first things that he tells them to do? Well, he says, go down before Pharaoh. Aaron, throw your rod on the ground, and it's going to become a serpent. Then Aaron took the rod back up. Well, Pharaoh called his sorcerers and said, hey, show them what you just showed me. And then they mimicked it. What is it? That is a manifestation of power. That through demonic worship, that through demonic rituals, they had communed with the fallen angels or the devils or demons and had either ascertained knowledge or had been imbued with some power to imitate the things of God. And we read it last week. Don't be taken aback with the fact that the devil will have prophets, those that sound good, because even Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light. He tries to duplicate but can never copy. It is not a perfect facsimile, as they would say. He can make it look like it, but when you get behind the curtain, you see that it's a movie set. There's nothing on the inside. Looks the same on the outside, but on the inside, it's just you know one wall and then a bunch of boards holding it up. There are no walls. There's no ceiling. Well, how did God prove it in that instance? Aaron's rod ate all the fake snakes, and then Aaron took it back up again, demonstrating that God's power is stronger. But, just like in Egypt, we mentioned Hinduism last week, there are millions, that's right, six zeros, plural, of deities that they worship. Amen. How did they come up with it? Man's creativity can only go so far. Millions? Some of them have a big enough problem just coming up with one. The really creative and we're going to mention them here in a bit, like Ron L. Hubbard, may write the most books in history, but you read them and you find out that this doesn't make much sense. But he came up with all of it. Or did he? Hold on to that. But where did all that come? Because someone sought spiritual enlightenment. They sought knowledge. And because they didn't seek God, God may have given them a space of grace. God may have given them an opportunity, but when they rejected it, the Bible tells us, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I don't know if you guys remember, but when Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you, that's true of godly things, but Satan will certainly allow you to find what you're seeking, receive what you ask for, and open doors that you're knocking on once God removes his space of grace. Or when God's mercy and in God's judgment, he says, that's enough. I've given them enough of an opportunity. Now, that's different for each individual. I'm not God. I don't claim to be. Don't claim to be Holy Ghost Junior either. Okay? Don't know what line it is for a person to cross where God says, that's enough. I'm just going to stay away from it. But those that seek these things out, they found something. And either they gave a name to that something, or that spirit, or that spirit gave them a name. How many different names do we have for Satan in the Bible? Maybe one entity with many names. But yet there are millions of them. And they may not go by a name. It may be a thought process. It may be a way to live your life. 
But most, I dare say, of satanic teachings and practitioners, again, knowingly or unknowingly, they may have been raised in it and that's all that they know. They may not know that it's satanic. They may not know that the spirit that they talk about is not the same Holy Spirit in this Bible. They may not know that the person that they bow down and worship, although he may be named Jesus, the Bible tells us that there would be many that prophesied in his name, many that did works, that even claimed to cast out devils, and at the judgment seat he'll say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. But they thought, because they were taught some of this stuff. And most of it originates from 1800s Europe. There was a movement of intellectual discovery called the Enlightenment. And it was a quest, so to speak, throughout the universities of Europe, through philosophers, through what today we would call sociologists. And they were looking for the knowledge that they needed to know what it is that they needed to know to solve all of the world's problems. Okay, now, this period of the Enlightenment, at its core, teaches that man can attain spiritual perfection. Once we learn what it is that we need to do, then we can do it. In other words, removing Jesus Christ from the picture. That's what they teach at its cores, and when you get into a lot of what is being taught, even in so-called churches today, it doesn't jive with the inspired Holy Scriptures. Okay? But at its core, it teaches that man can attain spiritual perfection through works, and in certain organizations, i.e., for one example, the Masons that we have right down the road. Okay, there are 33 degrees that you can attain. At level 32, guess what they teach you? Which originates from the Enlightenment. That you can know what it is that you need to know and do what it takes for you to do to overcome Lucifer. Remember what I taught last, or told you last week? Lucifer literally means light bringer. They think you can conquer the one that holds the light and by doing so take the light for yourself and reach spiritual perfection now if anybody in here wants to take a shot at the devil certainly be my guest you're going to lose in the flesh no man is a match for the devil but it is a lie that he tells them to get them into the trap and by the time that they realize that they are not strong enough to overcome him they are already firmly in his grasp. And they cannot set themselves free. But the Enlightenment teaching boils down to these two things. Okay, the philosophical movement before this established the thought process that man's reason can figure all things out. That's why if you get into so-called science, a lot of what they came up with doesn't make sense. And when challenged with certain things, I talked one time about, there was a documentary called uh, Is Genesis History on Netflix. It was a good one. But they talk about the great unconformity, where no matter where you go in the world, if you dig deep enough, there's this gap between bedrock and sand or dirt. Where did that come from? A universal flood. Why is there dirt from everywhere across the world in the Grand Canyon? A great flood. Why are there footprints that have been fossilized from dinosaurs. Because ash didn't slowly fall down from the sky, very slowly, and that dinosaur stayed in the position to leave those footprints. It happened very quickly and very rapidly, even, as you can tell, some of these things were in a full sprint. How'd that happen? They were buried by a whole bunch of mud and dirt in a great flood. And then they became fossils. You can refute a lot. Of, Darwin even recanted what he wrote on the theory of evolution or the natural selection, survival of the fittest. He, became, he got saved, became a Christian, and recanted for the rest of his life trying to undo the wickedness that he had done 
And it's it. But where did that knowledge come? It all stems from man can figure everything out. Man is smart enough to understand it all. But then the Enlightenment took that thought and then added to it with this. Man is the measure of all things. Not just man's reason can figure all things out. Man is the measure of all things. In other words, we can become everything, including God. And the teaching that you will even hear sometimes today, but was very prevalent time, is as above, so below. In other words, I can make myself like the things above here on the earth and attain spiritual perfection through logic and by making myself like the things that I have discovered. That's the enlightenment, in a nutshell. I did that very quickly. We could go on for weeks just on the enlightenment period. But let's look at the, that's the pollution of society, but how has that impacted religion, both true religion and false religion? Well, let's start at false religion. I've already told you that you can't reconcile any of these teachings with the Bible, but yet the devil's still out there speaking through spirits, and people are biting at a little bit of whatever it is that they desire, and then they become more entrenched in it. And those people, some of them, have risen to power and propagated these theories. And the world likes those theories because it doesn't have anything to do with God. It has to do everything with them. And then certain people that weren't involved with it became practitioners and partakers of it and taught it to others. They may never have communed with the Spirit. They may never have, you know, conducted a ritual trying to get these things, but they are partakers of the fruit of it. And some of them are teaching saved folk these doctrines making them partakers of the fruits of the devil. First and foremost, anything that isn't your KJV 1611 in English, not talking about for foreign languages that it wasn't translated into before English, but for English-speaking people, every other Bible came as a result of sat satanic influence. Amen. Even the new King James in the latest revision takes out Everything after verse number 8 in the last chapter of Mark. There's a footnote there that says, there were more verses, but critical evaluations show that they might not have been in there originally. You want to know why they took those verses? Because they can't rewrite them any other way. Because it talks about Jesus' divinity, how he's risen to sit down at the right hand of the Father, that he was the Son of God. But every false version and the revisions that they've made since started off changing a few things and more things. And now every false Bible came from one of two codexes or codices. One is the Vaticanus text that was controlled by the Catholic Church for so many years. And they could never find a copy that said the things that they claimed their oldest edition had until one mysteriously appeared in the 1800s during the Enlightenment called the Sinaiticus. It's the only other interpretation that agrees and removes the things about Jesus and the blood and man's sin and our fallen state and how there is only one way, one truth, and one life, and his name is Jesus. Amen. But those two versions have been used to make every false English version that has been translated. Shortly after the Sinaiticus was found, and they had a backup, so to speak, a second witness of, hey, not only the, the Vaticanus text, but also the... That's when uh, Wilcott and Hoyt released the first perversion. I think it was the English Revised Version, not the ESV, the ERV. And since then, others have taken that translation and retranslated. They didn't start with this started with something else. And that something else was man's works can make him holy. So anybody that goes to a different version of the Bible, partakers of satanic fruit, which means they no longer serve God. They're serving the will of Satan. And 
if God determines that they've gone further, the Bible tells us that even if they're saved, he'll turn the flesh over for destruction to the, so that the soul might be saved. Liberated from the grieving that they're doing to their own soul. But if they're lost, he may turn them over to a reprobate mind. And because they bought into what the devil was selling, they may not have been the one to pin it down, but they are condemning themselves either to a fleshly destruction or a spiritual destruction on the lake of fire. But if that's all they've been taught, how are they supposed to know the difference? Yeah. It's not just a different version. It's demonic. They teach that Jesus, in these modern translations, and it didn't start this way, it was a progression, but now, NIV, NKJV, ESV, the Jehovah's Witness Bible that's put out by the Watchtower, all of these false, the Mormon teachings, all teach that Jesus was just a man until he attained spiritual perfection and became a lowercase s son of God when he was baptized by John the Baptist. Through his, bapti through his works and then his baptism, that's why God opened up the clouds and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And they take out all references to the Trinity because there's only God and then there was Jesus. And they try to make him a man. Because if Jesus was a man, you too can become a lowercase Son of God. And through your learning and through your works, you too can steal the light from Satan. And you say, well, they believe almost everything we do, but they got a different Bible. God's promise was to preserve his words. Amen. How can we do what God wants us to do if we don't have the words of God telling us what to do? Right. But the world doesn't see that importance. And they don't see the words that we see. And if they're saved, they're certainly not in communication with the Spirit that uh, discerns the word. The word is spiritually discerned and reveals to us truth. They've got a different spirit showing them what it wants them to see out of their false Bible. But I've got to move. I'm running very short on time. But what it all boils down to in so-called Christians in the world that have bought into these things that trickle down from those that practiced satanic influences, these are people that claim to be like Christ. But they've got the wrong Christ. And if you've got the wrong Christ, you've got a false salvation. Okay, but then, there are the false religions. We've talked about some of them. This is a preview. We don't have to, I knew we didn't have time to get into this. But just to whet your appetite for next week, I've already mentioned Ronald Hubbard. You guys know that before he invented Dianetics or Scientology, he was a practitioner of occult magic with a K, which is how they differentiate David Copperfield from things that have power. And the group that he was a part of, the sole purpose was for the leader, which was not L. Ron Hubbard, but the leader to find a woman that was willing to participate in this lascivious sex act to bring about the birth of Mystery Babylon in Revelation. The leader believed himself to be the Antichrist. And you want to take part of the religion that that guy started? No, thank you. You can't convince me that one, some of the occult practices that are still prevalent in the church today, namely the belief that they are actually taking wafers and alcoholic wine, which isn't according to the Word of God, which you should use for communion, but they can take those two things and through a prayer and a blessing, they believe it turns into the physical body and blood of Christ and they become partakers or consumers of Christ. That's vampiric. That's satanic. But in addition, you can't convince me that some of the popes, which claim to be Christ on earth, and some of the wicked things that they've done, not to other believers, just in their own personal life, you can't convince me that they weren't possessed of demons. Amen. Some of the things that they sentenced others in the Spanish Inquisition to die from, the way that they concocted and they taught that through the pain and through the torture, their spirit was purified. Works. 
through suffering you can become pure. Last week I talked about, the, up until not too long ago, they taught that you had to physically punish yourself for your sin in order to, you know, to maim yourself, to cause yourself to bleed, that kind of stuff. Not just like giving up money, not just giving up time, but to co commit penance so that you can, through your works, complete the justification of yourself and the forgiveness of your sins. They don't teach that God forgives sins, but that priest can forgive your sins. And you finish it off through works. But all of that, what nowadays we would call humanism or New Ageism, there's so much of it in what they're teaching in elementary schools. What society is trying to accomplish through bills. That they're not, there doesn't just have to be equal opportunities, there has to be equal outcomes. They think that we can make other people better through our works, and by doing so, we will have a better society. How do you think the book of Revelation is going to happen where it's one government and one religion, and everybody's on the same page? Because half of them are believing it already. It's just different names. And when the Antichrist reveals himself, it's, no, 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 you guys had the right idea, but just the wrong labels because it already meshes together. That's the spiritual warfare that's going on out there. And most Christians are ignorant to it. And next week we're going to get into, Lord willing, some things in society more in detail and the religions in detail that are very popular, very prominent, things that they teach, things that have filtered into society. And as a result of them, if we do it, we become partakers of it, it's satanic. 